Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Yang Rui. In recent months, the South China Sea has once again become a hot issue. In observing joint U.S.-Filipino military exercises, U.S. Defense Secretary Ash Carter said this week that U.S. troops and military equipment would be sent on a regular basis to the Philippines. This came after a statement from G7 foreign ministers meeting in Japan, which said they wanted to express strong opposition to any intimidating, coercive, or provocative unilateral actions that could alter the status quo and increase tensions. So, are the rhetoric and blame games, which seem to grow ever louder, misrepresenting the situation in the South China Sea? And as some countries form unlikely alliances, what could be the solution in resolving these disputes? To discuss these issues and more, I'm joined in the studio by Professor Zhu Feng from Nanjing University. But first, let's take a look at this report by Su Yuting. She interviewed the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Lu Kang. We know that the Philippines has unilaterally initiated the South China Sea arbitration, and the Court of Arbitration is reportedly uh, to announce its uh, uh, the. Uh, Verdict very quickly in the coming two weeks. So, could you please tell us what's China's stance on the arbitration case and how will China respond to the court's decision? Uh, you know that actually China's attitude and our position uh, on this unilateral uh, arbitration request has been very clear worldwide. Uh, that is, we are not going to participate in any way. In this case, and we are not going to we are not going to accept the result. Uh, what kind of result it might come out from this arbitration case? Uh, you know that uh, this position is uh, a kind of uh, is is derived from China's uh, strong belief that this will definitely do harm on the international legal system instead of supporting that, uh, because you know according to the. Uh, and clause and the relevant articles. This, uh, the, uh, this kind of unilateral uh, presented case uh, actually has no role to play in prejudging or judging actually the issues related to sovereign claims or sovereign disputes. But the so called the South China Sea question, in essence, is a question of sovereign dispute over some islands and reefs. So let me be fair that if countries, some countries would like to pursue or unilateral resort to this kind of mechanism, it will do harm to the interests of the majority of the international community. Welcome to Dialogue, Professor Zhu. The G7 foreign ministers uh, issued a very strong worded statement, apparently expressing their strong dissatisfaction with the alleged provocative behavior by the Chinese Navy in the South China Sea. What do you think of the Chinese response? Yeah, I think that China's response is very expected. First of all, we uh, cement all the uh, uh, diplomatic delegates of the uh, G7 countries and just uh, very, I think, strongly and expressly expressing the Chinese anger. I think uh, such a G7, you know, is an uh, international uh, mechanism primarily addressing some sort of let's say, financial trading issues on a global base. Of course, G7 is a very important organization, but the problem is when the G7's uh, foreign minister, you know, the, the, the meeting just, uh, how say, in a very high profile, uh, condemning some sort of unilateral uh, actions in South China Sea, I think it's completely some sort of ill-placed uh, policy concern from the G7. Uh, on the other hand, I think that the, the use of the words by G7's, you know, the statesman is very malicious. It's very unfriendly. They say, first is they are opposed to any unilateral action. The second is such a unilateral action is also regarded as some sort of intimidating. Then it probably will lead into the coercion or some sort of, we say, uh, uh, unilateral change of the status quo. All such words is uh, full of imagination and a very one-sided, we say, uh, uh, illusion, you know, the thoughts. So over this point, I think China's response was very, very expectedly strong, and we should make clear to all the G7 uh, countries. So what China is doing with the land reclamation and, uh, and island construction in South China Sea is mostly in civilian use. 
and also targeting some sort of with the public goods provision. Let's look at some of the strong points implied in the joint statement from the G7 foreign ministers meeting. Is it clearly and absolutely just a unilateral action by the Chinese? No, not that way. For example, land reclamation. It's not the China uh, initiating some sort of land reclamation in the South China Sea. I think that Vietnam and the Philippines went after another. Just uh, started their you know, land reclamation from the early 70s. So in the past nearly 30 years, they never ended some sort of such an island construction, military facility build up, and also deployments of the increased number of the soldiers. So what China now is doing is some sort of a legal follow up to those claimants. So then when the China do that, it always caused some sort of screaming from the West, but every time Filipinos and the Vietnamese doing the same, but no one just trying to say anything, condemning or paying the attention. So I think such kind of the, uh, G7s, we say very erratic, you know, the, the, the eruption of their unhappiness about the China's land reclamation is really, really groundless. And the joint statement was released to coincide with the joint military maneuver between the U.S. and the Philippines. Of course, they signed the Mutual Defense Treaty in 1951, a legacy of the Cold War, by the way. Now, what do you think of the dramatic coincidence? Uh, was it yet another apparent signal, if not warning, to the Chinese government? Here, we are always and uh, we will be a Pacific power. I'm talking about the response from the U.S. government uh, to uh, kind of uh, patrol the international waters, uh, citing allegations of uh, possible violation and endangering the uh, freedom of navigation and overflight in international waters. What do you think of their concerns? Of course, it's very intended, rather than some sort of was a ban random uh, warning or action vis-a-vis -vis some sort of uh, so-called China's you know, uh, provocation uh, in the mouths of the Americans and the Filipinos. I think a um, uh, joint military drilling by the U.S. and the Philippines just have ended up, I think, uh, um, by just early this month. I think it was very unprecedented in terms of the size and some sort of, we say, uh, such an intended target. On the other hand, we also see the uh, U.S. And, uh, and the Filipinos also uh, very greatly reinforced their, their military alarms. So based on the uh, treaty, it's treaty is called um, Defense Cooperation Enhanced uh, Treaty. So U.S. now just uh, opened to five uh, new military bases. Then U.S. also well um, sent the equipment and the troops on the regular rotation. So it's a very big signal. Now the U.S. is reinforcing the military presence in South China Sea. Are you talking about actually the militarization of the South, South China Sea by the Philippines and the United States? And do you think China is, uh, I mean, which side is actually deliberately militarizing the South China Sea? Of it's course. yet another thorny issue to be addressed. Yes, we, we should, if we just take a very, very serious look at what is just the driving the real uh, military uh, then we will see it's the U.S. and it's arms. So the recent case just at the hand, as you mentioned, it's a, uh, uh, we say, uh, newly uh, declared uh, speedy rotation of the military soldiers and the equipment in the Philippines. But Up to 60 percent of the U.S. Navy and the Air Force will be deployed in the Asia-Pacific region. Yes. Do you think this is a, a larger part of the effort? Of course. That kind of the decision has also been pronounced in almost three years ago. But now there's a couple of uh, some sort of uh, chain reactions. Uh, from this, we say, pronounced uh, some sort of uh, reinforcement of uh, American military presence in the uh, Asian Pacific. So what's the South China Sea? South China Sea now is just the whirlwind, then just causing a lot of Americans' inputs. But with what kind of the, the, the purpose? The purpose now is, of course, definitely against the China's some sort of moves and the actions, but the problem is what China is doing is just uh, how they very legally and uh, reasonably stopping on the China clan and the China occupied <coughs> the maritime territory. Uh, Professor Zhu, let's uh, take a second look at the alleged legitimacy of China's occupation, development, and, uh, uh, and control of these uh, Nanshan Islands in the South China Sea. 
Now, China insists that our early, if not the earliest discovery of those uh, islands in, in this part of the world uh, means that we are protected by the UN law on the sea uh, because uh, the earliest discovery will of course enable us to enjoy the protection. Uh, that's what we call the historical legitimacy. But do you think this is accepted by the other side across the aisle? No, they don't accept. But I have to say for the time being they do not accept. But back to the uh, 70 years ago when the uh, Chinese government, um, back to in 1947, uh, draw the uh, U-shaped line and uh, declaring the China uh, claim all the maritime features in the South China Sea. There was no opposition. There was no denial because back to 1947, China was the biggest Asian ally to the United oh, uh, States. Wait a minute, uh, Professor Zhu. Uh, Ten years earlier, before 1947, when the Philippines was established as a republic, uh, what did their map say about the sovereignty of those islands? Yes, based on, we say, a very important legal instrument signed by the Washington and the Madrid, or say, between the U.S. and the Spain. So this new agreement very clearly uh, defined the, the size of the Philippines boundary. But even this very, very important legal instrument did not say anything or have no mentioning of any single words of Scarborough Show. In today's Chinese word, it's uh, Huang Yang Ali. Mm -hmm. So then uh, I think it's even afterwards, then we also see a couple of the new uh, Filipinos, you know, the, uh, uh, legal instruments also declare some sort of uh, real size of the Philippines territory. But I think the same situation is, is going on. So no single words mentioning Scarborough show totally belong to the Philippines. But now Philippines becomes some sort of very contentious claimant and always criticizing China of some sort of poaching in Scarborough show. It's part of the Philippines territory. It's totally unfair and illegal. Uh, the allegations aside uh, for a while, Professor Zhu, now between 1937, founding of the Philippine Republic, and 1947, something else uh, on our side also happened, there must be something in between. I mean, uh, the, the surrender, surrender of the Japanese Empire, and uh, what happened, uh, what was implied in the uh, Carroll Declaration and the Potsdam Declaration oh. about the uh, sovereignty of those islands in the South China Sea? Of course. So if we are uh, checking the historical roots of the China's uh, uh, territorial uh, justification over uh, the claim in the South China Sea, we see a, a number of a very important historical documents. Just you mentioned it's a Cairo Declaration and the Boston uh, 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 Statement. They also very unambiguously just uh, declare that all the territory illegally occupied by imperialist Japan should be very, very justifiably and fairly returned to the China. So then, you know, the uh, Parasol Island and the Spratly Island uh, once occupied by the imperial uh, Japanese troops. So they declare so those two uh, islands will be merged into the one body. They, they, in Japanese name, they call it uh, Shinnan uh, Jima. So this Shinnan Jima occupied by Japan in the Second World War. But after Japan defeat, it's also legally and very, very uh, explicitly returned to the China. So back to 1947, uh, Nanjing government, uh, we say the KMT government, government of yeah, the Kuomintang. KMT government mm -hmm. use the warship, gifted it from the United States, and the with the uh, uh, credential from the, the, the American airlines, we not just the patrols the, the, the South China Sea, but also uh, very uh, wholly and, and seriously finished some sort of we say uh, uh, ceremony of uh, taking back from imperialist Japanese uh, uh, troops, those uh, China's territory. So it's also very formally declared to all the words, we now reclaim all such as South China Sea's uh, islands, rocks and fields. Thank you very much. Professor Du, you're watching Dialogue with uh, Mr. Du, a professor from Nanjing University, also ex expert of maritime studies in the South China Sea. We shall be back in a few minutes. Please stay with us. Welcome back, sir. Um, look, uh, obviously, 
uh, people feel confused, particularly those uh, who observe the development of the maritime disputes in South China Sea from the U.S. They accuse China of militarizing Yunxing Island, which actually is located in uh, Xisha or uh, Paracel Islands. It's different from the uh, uh, Spratly Islands. It is in the Spratly Islands or around those islands uh, disputes uh, flared up between uh, the Philippines uh, and other uh, claimants uh, and, and China. So what do you think of the uh, U.S. accusation and um, and how do you define militarization? Because China deployed uh, some uh, fighter jets as well as uh, uh, ground to uh, to air missiles there, and that immediately immediately caused uh, consternation from the international society. Of course, I think the Americans' condemnation in that regard is absolutely a mistake, because. Uh, on most of occasions, when we see the both sides, Chinese and Amer Americans, just argue uh, on the militarization, usually it does not cover <coughs> the Palasa Island, we say Shisa Island. I think a lot of historical archives also uh, very strongly uh, demonstrate U.S. actually acknowledge and also respect the China's sovereign claim in Palasa Islands. But so far, uh, U.S. just uh, put the two things uh, very inherently, but very, very mistakenly, uh, into the wine. They say Palisar Island is also very disputed one. So then, any China's limited but necessary defense buildup in Shisha Island is also some sort of a provocation. We say it's not just Americans' confusion. It's not just a mistake. It's very intended, some sort of diplomatic attack to the China's. Uh, legalized, we say, the moves in South China Sea. Sprat Island, yes, including China, I think the international community also recognized there is uh, some sort of uh, disputes we needed to get them resolved. But Sprat Island issue is uh, definitely different from the uh, Sprat Island issues. So U.S. not just uh, has they needed to uh, make uh, uh, clear, it should have just uh, uh, very uh, rightful, rightfully just uh, uttered there, uh, there are some sort of a view. But most important thing, they also should just uh, have say admit their very essential position. For example, American governments repeatedly say there is no position of the United, United States at all about who should be more legal to claim this island. But now I see the U.S. some sort of such a mistake and a confusion really contradict the Americans' proclaimed uh, position. Excuse me, but do we have a single voice from the U.S. side? Because we have the Congress, the White House, the, uh, the military, which is uh, growing more, you know, uh, angry, and there's a lot more disquiet from the Pentagon on the issues in the South, Ch South China Sea. Which side we should trust? Yeah, well, I see uh, diversity of the Americans, some sort of political uh, views and voices on such a kind of scene. Uh, different factors, different, you know, the lines, they usually also are diverged somehow. For example, Pentagon usually is more vocal and uh, more critical. Then the White House relatively, uh, uh, um, we say, uh, diplomatic. Wait a minute, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi paid a visit to the D.C. and yet, uh, um, Secretary of Defense uh, Ash Carter refused to meet with uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi as uh, scheduled. This time around, during his tour of East Asia, he refused to come to Beijing as scheduled again. In both cases, uh, uh, the media, uh, Chinese foreign alike, uh, 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 say, well, this is a clear signal that the Pentagon is increasingly unhappy and dissatisfied with what's happening in the South China Sea. Do you think this is an, a warning or do you think China will buy this idea that uh, this is an unfriendly gesture? No, no, I see that kind of a rejection or denial to meeting with Chinese compound is some sort of American elegancy and a complacency as well. So we also see the South China Sea issue now is uh, uh, very bitter and a heater we say uh, uh, disputed the issue. So every time the U.S. and China just uh, came across such a uh, we say um, uh, divisions or, or, or frictions, one way we should expect the lead to to respond. Let's sit down, meeting, talking, and seeking some sort of uh, we say operable solution. 
That's what the two countries needed to endorse. But now I think the Ashton Carter is just trying to leave the Chinese compound, some sort of cold shoulder, and use this some sort of the, uh, elegance to sabotage some sort of the Chinese uh, real intention to talk with American compound. I don't think it's really, really, you know, the, the appropriate. We have other mechanisms to strengthen dialogue. For example, the one that is uh, taking place in Shangri-La to promote mutual understanding about the regional issues. Having said this, Article 51 of the UN Charter entitles UN members to the inherent right to self-defense. Now, would you elaborate on the differences between self-defense and militarization in the South China Sea? I think the militarization is some sort of uh, new cat. The, 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 the Pentagon is just trying to uh, cast on China's head. It's also some sort of a new labyrinth of the uh, American's way, uh, describing or, in other words, demonizing China's move in South China Sea. Of course, we totally disagree. On the other hand, if there is anyone to do militarizing in South China Sea, I think it's the United States. How many American warships and J fighters just uh, have patrolled and uh, fried over in South China Sea? I think the PECOM's commander also acknowledged, even in 2015, totally it's uh, 70 hundred hours. The PECOM's fleets and warships just back and forth patrolling in South China Sea. Just because PECOM's some sort of patrolling and, it's, and, and uh, we say uh, uh, freedom of navigation driven the military uh, uh, missions in South China Sea, then the tension now is simmering. So I have to say, if there is someone to blame to lead the militarization in South China Sea, it's not a China only. It's the U.S. first. Manila unilaterally initiated a legal lawsuit against China on the maritime disputes in the South China Sea. In fact, the filing filed by Manila in this case, uh, on this case, uh, before the International T uh, Court of Arbitration in The Hague, which is expected to, uh, in a few weeks. Uh, do you think this will help, or rather it will complicate the situation in the South China Sea? What would be the most likely response from the Chinese government following the results of the international arbitration? Of course, I think the uh, Philippines firing of the uh, arbitration case vis-a-vis -vis China uh, they, say, they say it's their right. Yes, we can admit that. But real consequence of the Philippines firing of the case to international arbitration is not just a unilateral, but it's also undermining some sort of a long-time accumulation of the diplomatic consensus on how this period should be re re uh, settled. For example, uh, back to the 2002, China and ASEAN countries signed in the joint declaration uh, of conduct in South China Sea. I think it's a very, very helpful for all ASEAN countries and China working together, sitting together, searching for some sort of real and realistic you know, the way to calm down over the uh, territorial disputes. But now the Philippines is really regardless of the China's opposition and some sort of uh, a huge space of uh, uh, diplomatic maneuver and just uh, uh, leave the China alone and uh, take the Americans' hand, use some sort of uh, international, so-called international sympathy to file a case against China. But if we have a serious look at the Philippines firing, we see it's very ponous. There's a lot of shortcomings, pitfalls. So, of course, they just based on America's law firm's, you know, technical support. So far, the firing is on process. But the problem is, I think it's also a common sense for the international community. Whatever the ruling will be by the international tribunal, uh, any realistic solutions should be through the country's consent and agreement. Thank you very much. With that, we come to the end of this edition of Dialogue on Maritime Disputes in the South China Sea. Obviously, we have more to discuss next time when Professor Zhu is available in town, Beijing, downtown Beijing. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.